And in this story, we find the main emphasis that Jesus makes is on the second kind of sinner. Because this is the kind of sinner, brothers and sisters, hear me on this, that is least likely to come home to the Father. The scripture reading today comes from Matthew 9, 10 through 12, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And so it was as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Amen. Um, all of you know at this point that we are in our final, fourth and final message in this series, A Tale of Two Sons, and, you know, we've looked at this story week by week, and uh, by the way, next week, you know, uh, we're going to be addressing one question among others, and that is, who's making, or who's calling the plays in your life? And, uh, you know, preseason football has started now, and we want to look at something next week, and, and we're going to look at a sermon we're going to call God's Game Plan, but... But today, again, this is our last in this series that we're doing, A Tale of Two Sons. And I read a story, you know, some time ago about a Sabbath school teacher. And she was telling this story to her students in her Sabbath school class. She told the story of the prodigal son. And, of course, she mentioned how this prodigal had went away. And he came back to the house. And when he came back, his father was there to receive him. And he hugged his son. He put the ring on his finger and the coat on his back and the shoes on his feet. And... They went out and they killed the fatted calf and they, they cooked the fatted calf and they made this big meal of him. And then the, you know, she also told about the older son who refused to join the party. And after the story, she started to ask them some questions about what she had just told them. And she said, boys and girls, who is not happy to see the prodigal son return? And one little boy was quick to speak up and say, the fattened calf. <clears throat> The one who actually was not happy to see him was the elder brother. And we're going to take a look at the elder brother this morning. And, and uh, you know, the story ends in a cliffhanger, if you will. It ends with, with, um, with the, the end not having been written yet. And Jesus did that on purpose. He left it up to those who were uh, listening, the hearers of the story, to fill that in. And so before we open the scriptures, I want to invite you, if you would, to let's please pray together one more time. Father, this morning we uh, want to come to you as a church family. We want to pray for the outpouring of your spirit as we conclude this series today. Lord, what a beautiful story that Jesus told it illustrates your love and grace and forgiveness. And so I just pray today that as we do come to the end here, at least for now, that your spirit will speak to us in the manner that you would see fit to each of us individually. And so, Lord, we're praying again for the spirit of the living God among us. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Luke chapter 15, if you would, we're going to pick up with the elder brother, Chapter verses 25 through 32. Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. And as you're turning there, uh, what I want you to do this morning is imagine that you are one of the scribes or the Pharisees. You are a legalist, and, and you're listening as Jesus tells this story. And in your assessment of what's been going on so far in this story, that every one of these characters that Jesus has told about, everyone in the story so far, they... Uh, they the thing they've, they have done has been filled with shame. The prodigal's escapades, they were scandalous. The father's rush to forgive this boy was, was appalling. And along the way, you as a scribe or a Pharisee, as a legalist, you've been producing gasps and exclamations and, and gestures in all the places where you felt you needed to make your approval known to those around you. 
To your way of thinking, the Father's determination to celebrate is just another uh, one of those troubling occurrences, perhaps the worst thing that's happened so far in the story. It's something you could not have foreseen, and, and you don't like the direction that the story's going. But nevertheless, as a Pharisee or a scribe, the story has kind of pulled you in because it, it has the major things that are important to you, the themes that are important like um, honor and dishonor and, and shame and, and approval versus disapproval. And so you've been following this story all along with the expectation that those who have been acting so shamefully in this story, surely by the end of this story, they're going to reap the appropriate consequences. And so you're waiting for someone to do something that makes sense to you. And now as Jesus in this story mentions this elder brother, he's your last best hope. You're, as a Pharisee, you're thinking to yourself, surely this guy's going to get the story straight. He's going to correct things that's been so inappropriate so far. Luke 15, picking up in verse 25. I'm reading for a, for a reason from the New Living Translation this morning. <clears throat> it says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother's back, he was told. Your father's killed the fattened calf. We're celebrating him because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in, and his father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years, I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. In all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead, has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. I think it's obvious that there are two types of sinners that are found in this story. One of them is the, is the, the, the prodigal type. He is the sinner that, that's straightforward in your face. He's a sinner. He doesn't know who cares. He doesn't have a relationship with God. He makes no pretense of having a relationship with God. And so the prodigal represents those to whom the scribes and Pharisees were so irate at Jesus about when we look back in verses 1 and 2 of this same chapter. They were upset with Jesus, the tax collectors, the sinners, because Jesus was hanging out with these lost people, these unclean people. So they were upset. And so Jesus tells this story as a result of this attitude that these people have. But this prodigal is the one, again, this, the, the lost people. And the other kind of sinner that's represented by the elder brother is he, he's much more on the sly. There's a pretense of a relationship with God, but it's only on the surface. It doesn't go below the skin. And in this story, we find the main emphasis that Jesus makes is on the second kind of sinner. Because this is the kind of sinner, brothers and sisters, hear me on this, that is least likely to come home to the Father. It may or may not come as a surprise to you for me to tell you that the Father in heaven probably sees you and I, you and me, as the older brother instead of as the younger son. Think about it. If you're here in this sanctuary, if you're listening online somewhere or whatever, you, you have probably, chances are, you've already come to the Father through Jesus. You've ex repented of your sins. You've accepted Jesus as your Savior. And so uh, let me ask you a question with that in mind rhetorically. Don't answer out loud. How many of us would be happy to hear that Osama bin Laden had prayed for forgiveness and received it, and he's going to be ready for heaven when Jesus comes? How many of us... Uh, don't raise your hand, brother. <laughs> I might be tricking you. You don't know. Uh, or that Saddam Hussein, think about Saddam Hussein and all the atrocities that he, that he was guilty of, that he accepted Jesus' forgiveness before he was hung. How would you feel if you got to heaven one day when Jesus came and you get there and there's Hitler? Now, if those ideas make you a little bit uncomfortable... We've probably got more of a little bit of, the, a little bit of the, the older brother in us than we think we do. Number one on your handout, 
we tend to do is what we tend to do is set the bar so low that uh, it's low enough for our salvation, but, we, but not so low that other sinners can make it in. You know what I mean? Um, we kind of each view, have this minimum level of salvation that you've got to attain to this level, and it's usually based somewhere around the way we, our spiritual experience is. You know, we kind of have figured out this is what you've got to do, this is what you don't have to do, and so we kind of, what we generally do is we place Mother Teresa or John the Baptist up here on, on the one end of the scale, and then we place somebody like uh, Hitler on the other end, and we place ourselves somewhere in between those two, and we calibrate our salvationometer, if you will, based on that understanding. And so, in the elder brother, minds, everyone who falls below this certain predetermined level of their salvation ominers didn't deserve God's grace. Number two, one of the uh, lessons that we'll learn from this example of the elder brother and the, and the self-righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees in this story is that it is possible to spend an entire lifetime in and around, coming to church, doing the right things, around the household of faith, giving you know, all the right appearances of working hard, of doing the things you need to be doing, and yet somehow be completely out of harmony with God's will, with the things that makes heaven happy. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a young man who never left his father's house. He's never been out carousing and drinking as far as we know. He, he's never been wasting his money. He's stayed close to home. He's been a faithful worker. He's, 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 he's did all the right things, but he had all the wrong reasons. Underneath this brother's difference, a, a different pattern of behavior is the same motivation. Both of them have the same motivation. Both are using the Father in different ways to get the things for which their hearts were set on. And it was probably the wealth, not the love of the Father, that they believe would make them happy and fulfilled. And if, like the elder brother, we seek to control God through obedience then all your morality is just a way to, to try and use God somehow to help to, to encourage him to give you the things in life that you want or you think that you deserve. One of the most startling statements that Jesus ever made was to religious people. And what we're about to read should cause us to all seriously consider or reconsider where we stand with God. And, and Albert preached on this passage two weeks ago, so I'm not going to preach on it. I just want to share it again. But I already had this in the sermon, and I, I, I don't want to pass this up. But Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Sounds good so far. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees, the elder brothers, they can agree to that. This, is, this sounds right, you know. We, we, the, they're, they're saying amen to this, this text. You do what the Father says, you get the prize. You get the reward if you do the right things. But Jesus didn't stop there. Look in verse 22. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? So who's he talking to? He's talking to us, right? He's talking to the church, to the church people. He's talking to the preachers and the teachers and the greeters and the, and the elders and the deacons. We are the ones he's speaking to here. And you've heard this verse read many times, but verse 23 says this, But I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Brothers and sisters, this tells me that if we are not careful, we can be self-deceived. And that is the worst kind of deception, is self-deception. We can stay home and never go to the far country and still be lost. But Jesus sees right through it. The danger is for us to be self-deceived and like this elder brother and, and, and like the scribes and the Pharisees. And when you look down through the history of the church, there's been a a lot of, the, of these elder brother figures that we could find. And John Wesley had this conversion experience. I've got this book, a powerful book, that goes through these uh, conversion experiences of people. But uh, St. Teresa was one of these ladies. And she, had, she lived back in the 16th century, and she never left the father's house. She had entered a convent to be a nun at a young age. And, 
And she developed this life of self-discipline and these spiritual disciplines that would fill anyone with religious jealousy, if you will. She spent hours a day in prayer. And her story says that one day, when she was in her mid-40s, she entered into the chapel to pray just like she did every day. And as she entered into that chapel, just like she did every day, there was a picture that was there every day. But she saw this picture, and it was a picture of Jesus being uh, beaten just before the crucifixion. And something came over her. She had this sudden realization of what it meant. It came to her that Christ had been beaten for her. And those who wrote about, about her life said this was the great turning point in her life. And the point is this, there was joy in heaven that day, not over a soul who's returning from the far country, but for a soul who's returning from the field after a hard day's labor. You hear what I'm saying? Verse 25, now his older brother, his, excuse me, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Number three, people often assume that the elder son represents a true believer that has been faithful all his life. He's doing the right things. But what happened is Jesus, you know, told this story. It, or it just kind of, it threw him off guard when he, when he heard about his brother coming. He kind of got thrown off guard. And so therefore he was resentful about it. But when we look at that old elder brother like that, all that, that he really needs is an attitude adjustment. Right? I mean, that's all he would need at this case, but that's far from what Jesus is saying because that interpretation misses the whole point of this parable. The elder son had never truly been devoted to the Father, as we're going to see. You know, Jesus was a master storyteller. He knew how to draw people into the stories that he told. And these Pharisees were about to become a part of this story. They didn't realize it at this point. And they had been following the story all along. They had been making their judgments in their mind that they thought should be made. And up to this point, they were still looking at this story as outsiders. They were on the outside looking in, passing their judgments on the prodigal, on the, uh, on the, the father, and even on Jesus as he was telling this story. But all of a sudden, Jesus ingeniously turns the tables on them and puts them under the microscope all of a sudden. And from the InterVarsity Press commentary, it says this, The elder son has been laboring in the field, so he's missed all the action. Returning home, he hears the commotion of the music and dancing. In fact, it says the word for music is the Greek term from which we get our word symphony. But in ancient Greek, symphonia was a broad term for music or singing. In other words, it's saying there's this real celebration going on. So there's a party happening there. Lots of loud music. And there's joy. And so this feel from where this brother is working must be some distance away from the house. Or he would, have, he would have heard it before now, before he starts coming home. And so when he gets within a half a mile or so of the house, he starts to hear this music. He might have smelled that roasted calf going, and you would think that he would run to see what's going on, but he doesn't because he becomes suspicious. And these kind of sinners are always suspicious, especially if they're around uh, joyful people. Verse 26. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Takes us back to the start of this story here. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. The real life situation that Jesus was addressing. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. And, and the Pharisees and scribes complained saying, This man receives sinners and eats with him. You know, throughout the ministry of Jesus, when you look at his, his life as, we're, as we find it, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the lawyers, they um, often made these accusations about Jesus. They called him a Sabbath breaker. They said, this man is possessed by a devil. They said he's a, a blasphemer. They said he's a wine bibber. But the only accusation that was true that they made of Jesus was found in Matthew 11 when they said, this man is a friend of sinners. And that was right, wasn't it? Number four, Jesus was never accused of standing outside the party with his arms folded and his nose in the air. Never. That was not the kind of life, that was not the kind of picture that the scriptures paint of Jesus. 
People were drawn to Jesus. He, he was so full of love and compassion that people flocked to him. People wanted to be around him. They wanted to have his companionship. I want you to look with me at John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 on the screen, or you can go in your Bibles if you'd like. Something I saw several years ago, and it says this, and remember, this is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. John 2, verse 1 and 2 says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So what? You know, the question in my mind and it'll come, we'll come back around to where we're at, was why would Jesus, on his very first journey, the very start of his ministry, the first thing he does, he takes his disciples to a party. The, the, these weddings that they had back then were not some, you know, as a pastor, I'm going to make them quick as I can, so if I ever do your wedding, just expect it to be boom. It's going to be fast. It's not going to be day-long occasions. I mean, these were week-long occasions sometimes. And so this, this was a, a huge shindig, if you will, that they were going to. It could last for a long time. And I think, well, didn't Jesus and his disciples, he knew his time was short. Didn't he have some work to do? Didn't, didn't they have principles to teach? Didn't they have messages to preach to the multitudes? Didn't he have scribes and Pharisees that he needed to be rebuking? Wasn't his time limited? Didn't he? What was his thinking in his time frame here? How could a wedding fit into the purpose on earth? Why did he go to the wedding? And it's found in verse 2. The New Living Translation says this, And Jesus and his disciples were also, what? Invited to the celebration. What do you mean by that? Well, let me tell you what I mean by that. Think about it. When the bride and groom or the wedding coordinators that they had hired, whoever was doing this, was putting a list together of people we want to come to the wedding, they're going through, make sure you invite so-and-so, and make sure you invite this person and that person. And as they come, they're thinking, oh, oh, wait, wait, make sure that Jesus is there. We want Jesus to be at, this, at our wedding when he comes. And so whoever was hosting this party was happy to have Jesus there. They didn't invite Jesus because he was a celebrity. He was famous yet because he wasn't. This is, this is his first journey. He just got his disciples gathered together. He just got his posse. They're just starting now. He, they wasn't motivated to invite him because he had performed all these miracles. He had not performed a miracle yet. This is going to be his first miracle at this wedding. So I think, why in the world did they invite Jesus to this wedding? I think they just liked him. They wanted Jesus there. Think of the unspoken theology in that, in methodology maybe. In your bulletin, Adventist Home, page 428 and 429 says, social power, notice, social power sanctified by the grace of Christ must be improved in winning souls to the Savior. So you think, I don't have any spiritual gifts. I can't do this, or I can't preach, or I can't teach. But you know what? Maybe you have some social abilities that some of us might not have. And it says this social power, sanctified by the grace of Christ. So you hear that? Don't throw a wild party. There's got to be something sanctified by the grace of Christ. But it says, it must be improved in winning souls to the Savior. Let the world see that we're not selfishly absorbed in our own interests, but that we desire all others to share our blessings and privileges. Let them see that our religion does not make us unsympathetic or exacting. Wow. Social power. Sanctified by God's grace is one of the things that we need to be working at to win others to Jesus. Um, I think it's significant that, that common people in a little town enjoyed being with Jesus. I think it's, it's noteworthy that the Almighty didn't act high and mighty. That the Holy One, He wasn't holier than thou. That the one who knew it all wasn't a know-it-all. That the one who made the stars in the sky didn't keep his head stuck in them. That the one who, who, who owns all of the stuff of the earth, he never strutted it, though he could have. And on his shoulders, and again, thinking about the time frame that he had, this limited time, three and a half years, basically, of his ministry, once he was baptized, and on his shoulders rested the the salvation of the entire creation, but he still took time to walk 90 miles from Jericho to Cana to go to a wedding. People just wanted to be around him. 
He was accepting. He was loving. But that's not the attitude of the elder brothers. Verse 28 through 30. I'm reading from the New Living Translation for a reason now. 28 through 30 of Luke 15. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. The scribes and the Pharisees, for the first time in this story, they say, yes, finally. Some sense has come into this story. This is the right attitude they're thinking. This is precisely what any self-respecting person would be saying at this point is how they felt. It's about time someone in this story had some sense about it. And the seething inner rebellion of these scribes and the Pharisees, it comes surf to the surface vicariously through this elder brother now. You know, I used the New Living Translation in some of the verses this morning because... In, in these verses in particular, because it rightly uses the word slave. He says, all these years I've slaved for you rather than served you. Because the Greek, the Greek word doulos, which means slave. And so that's the proper translation here. In other words, this old elder son is admitting his legalistic mindset. He's saying, everything that I have been doing for you is based because I felt compelled to do so. Not because I love you, not because I want to please you, but I've been compelled to do this. I've been compliant on the outside, but I have been rebelling on the inside. Heard this story about a mother who was... Uh, Kept telling her little boy, sit down, sit down. He wouldn't listen to her. She kept saying, sit down, son. And, and finally she, she reached over and, and she, she put her hands on his shoulders and she pressed him down into a seat and she forced him to sit there. And he looked up at her with this little, seam, you know, this little seething rebellion in his eyes. He says, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. And that's what this elder brother, this, the, these, these scribes and the Pharisees, this is what's happening. His service to his father had been a drudgery that was equivalent to slavery in his mind. So why did he stay all those years? Probably because he was the eldest son. He stood to receive two-thirds of, of his father's inheritance. He was going to be the, you know, the, the man. He was going to be the man. You know, he was going to be over it all at this point. He wasn't willing to take the cash payout like his brother did, but his attitude was the same. Both of those brothers. He, he, he couldn't wait for his father to die so he could get the money that he felt was coming to him. Number five, if like the elder brother you believe that God ought to bless you and to help you because you have worked so hard to obey him and you've tried so hard to be a good person, then Jesus may be your helper, he may be your example, he may be your inspiration, but Jesus is not your savior. You are your own savior. The targets of this story are not wayward sinners, but religious people like us who do everything the Bible requires. And Jesus is, is pleading not so much with immoral outsiders, but with moral insiders like you and I. I want you to notice that the cruelest stab uh, he takes at his father, uh, the worst thing that would have struck at the heart of the father here, he, he wouldn't even claim his reclaimed brother. He refers to him as this, this son of yours. Number six, you know, when we have no concern for the lost, when we don't have any concern for those who are outside, when we're not worried about seeking the lost, that takes a stab at the heart of God. It's, 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 it, it, it's, it eats at the heart of God. And this, brothers and sisters, is why in Matthew 7, Jesus says, in the end, there's going to be a group of church people that will come to him one day and said, you know, you remember that sermon I preached? Those people, remember how they loved that sermon? 
You remember those, those, those women's ministry events I led out in or I participated in? You remember all the tithe I gave over those years and all that offering and, and all the church service I went to? And he's going to say, but, but what about your attitude to those who were on the outside? What about those who were not a part of the flock? What about the, the prodigal children? Were you seeking them like that shepherd sought the lost sheep? Were you seeking them like the woman who searched desperately for that lost coin? Or the father who waited and watched and welcomed with open arms this prodigal boy? when he came home. The elder brother represents the heartless, cold attitude that the Pharisees had towards the sinners. But notice that in spite of how this elder brother is responding to his father, notice how the father responds to him. Verse 28. <clears throat> his father came out and begged him, according to the New Living Translation. So for the second time in this day, the father is, is offering this costly demonstration of his love. Only now his love is being offered to a law keeper, not a law breaker. But amazing grace is shown to both of these brothers here. And you know, this father is the patriarch of this family. He would have been expected, you know, or, or, uh, to, to ignore this irrational irritable response of this elder brother. In fact, just like the younger brother, he could have taken him and, and had him beaten publicly because of the way he's responding to his father. But he doesn't respond that way. He goes out again, notice. Uh, he's not running down the street to greet his child here, but he's, he's going out in the courtyard to plead with his son. And he would have probably been within earshot of all the guests that were there. And so he, he goes out in this painful humiliation again, uh, uh, something that was unheard of. And his father's going out to seek the lost child, the lost sheep, the one that's so close, and yet at the same time he's so far away. Verse 31 and 32 and he said to him, Son, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead, is alive again, was lost, and is found. In this passage, the word son is used eight times. And the first eight times, there's a formal word that's used for son here. But in this, this, this last time, he uses a different term in the Greek, and it's a tender term meaning like my child, my precious child. So this is a, a tender entreaty to this elder brother. So Jesus is still showing his, his passionate love even for those who treated him the worst, who he knew were going to nail him to a cross. And his, his dearest term is used for these men. And the story ends like it began. Jesus on the outside trying to win a sinner. Everyone else is on the inside enjoying the party, but Jesus is outside laboring for a sinner again. And the story, it ends abruptly. You know, it would have been like, boom, wait, wait, where's, where's the rest? What's going to happen now? But the abruptness of the ending of this story, it doesn't help but cause us to miss the point. It is the very point of the story. That's the reason Jesus is telling it. it, it the, final, it's the final blow, if you will, in this series of shocking twists in the story that is told. And Jesus told the story for these scribes and Pharisees. And the unwritten resolution was entirely up to them. The next move was theirs. And Jesus crafted this story so that for their sakes, that, and he left the ending up to them. You know, as we begin to close this series this morning, God is doing everything he can in his power to seek the loss. He, uh, he seeks the one who's left for the far country. At the same time, he's seeking the one who's, who stayed home and is working in the fields. The heart of Jesus goes out to every one of us sinners, wherever we fall, whether it be somewhere in between or whichever extreme it might be. Remember, this story was told for the Pharisees' utter lack of compassion for those who were lost. And so it's a mistake then to think, and some have used it this way, that Jesus is telling this story primarily just to assure the younger brothers, those ones who are way out there, you know, in left field, that, uh, that I'm going to love you unconditionally. 
You know, those listeners who, who, who Jesus was telling this to, for the purpose of these who were listening, that's not the way they would have took us. This wouldn't have melted their heart and wouldn't have brought tears to their eyes, but they would have been thunderstruck. They would have been offended. They would have been infuriated by this story. And, and Jesus' purpose here in this story is not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our categories. And through this parable, Jesus challenges what nearly everyone has ever thought about God and sin and salvation. After I printed off these handouts, I changed the order of number seven and eight. So number eight on your handout, the parable of the prodigals is not just a warm and fuzzy feel-good message, but it's a powerful wake-up call with a very earnest, serious warning. That's what it is. <clears throat> I want to close this sermon and this series with a story this morning. I read this story many years ago, and I'm going to just quote it. It says, I saw him in the church building for the first time on Wednesday. He was in his mid-70s with thinning silver hair and a neat brown suit. Many times in the past, I had invited him to come. Several other Christian friends had talked to him about the Lord, had tried to share the good news with him. He was a well-respected, honest man with so many characteristics that a Christian should have. He said, a few years ago, I'd ask him, have you ever been to a church service in your life? And the story says he hesitated. It says, then, with a bitter smile, he told me of his childhood experience some 50 years ago. He said he was one of many children in a large, impoverished family. He said his parents had struggled to provide food with little left for housing and, and even decent clothing. When he was about 10, some neighbors had invited him to come to church with him. And he went to church, and that Sabbath was, it was a beautiful experience for him. He said the Sabbath school class had been very exciting for this young 10-year-old boy. He said he'd never heard these songs and these stories before. In fact, he had never heard anyone read from the Bible before. He was excited about it all. And he went on to say that right after the class was over, the teacher took him aside and said, Son, please don't come again dressed here as you are now. We want to look our best when we come into God's house. It says he stood in his ragged, unpatched overalls. Then looking at his dirty, bare feet, he answered softly, No, ma'am, I won't ever. And I never did, he said, abruptly ending the conversation. The writer went back to first person and, and wrote, Yes, I saw him in the church for the first time on Wednesday. As I looked at that immaculately dressed old gentleman lying in his casket, I thought of the little boy of long ago. I could almost hear him say, No, ma'am, I won't ever. Now I know we would never respond to anyone like that. And that story is one of those tearjerker stories, at least it is for me. And, and it hurts our hearts to even hear that somebody might do something like that. But you know, I believe that if we are not actively seeking the lost in some fashion, we might as well be saying, you're not welcome in my father's house. You may not be saying it to people you meet, but your, by our actions, maybe that's the message that we're giving. Number seven, if you'll back up to number seven, the very life of the church depends on her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. Where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. As we close this series this morning, and as we're about to sing our closing hymn, I want you to think of the words of the song. Think of the message of this story that Jesus has told. And as we sing it, I'm going to leave it like Jesus did. I'm going to leave it hanging. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward or make any commitments or sign in on the line or check any boxes. I just want you in your heart. The, 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 it's left hanging for you to answer. How are you going to respond to this? And so we're going to sing our...